Hey, Don, it's David Cloninger with the Post and Courier back home. Uh, just a couple for you today. One, could you just talk about the unselfishness? Um, of our team? David, are you still there? Looks like we're having some audio difficulties with him. We'll go to our next. I'll just I'll just try to answer what I thought he was asking. Um, if he was asking, is that you, David? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me? I didn't hear the last part of your your question. NIL legislation has been a big topic lately. What do you think about players maybe someday being able to profit off of their name, image, and likeness? Um, I mean, I, I mean, the, the talk is a you know a hot topic now that everybody's together. Um, at each tournament, you know, I, I, I'm for the student athlete being able to use their name, image, and likeness. Um, how they go about doing that, and how we go about legislating that—that's um, way above my pay grade. Our next question will come from Elliot Almond. Elliot, go ahead. Hi. Good morning, Don. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking uh, the questions today. Uh, you were there in 92 when Tara last won a, a title. Now it's three decades later, which seems to be pretty amazing. I was just um, doing the math, and if you, I think you're going to win a lot of titles, perhaps one this weekend, but let's say you don't win one, it would be 2046 to have sort of an equivalent. It would be that long before you would be able to do it again. What does it mean that Tara, I mean, is still doing this? Is it, is it kind of remarkable as a, as a young coach coming up? What do you think? Um, you know, for, for Tara and all the, the coaches who have dedicated their lives to growing the game and, and, grow, and impacting young people um, as they have, I mean, it, it says that they're doing it for all the right reasons. Um, there's no way that a coach would um, stay in a profession that they didn't um, reap some some inner satisfaction um, being a dream merchant for for young people. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you know. You said 2046. Um, I I won't be one of those coaches that that stick around that long, um, you know. But I will show my gratitude to those who have stayed in the game this long. I, I applaud them. Um, you know, I, I do want Tar to get another national championship, just not like in 1992 at, at my expense. Our next question will come from Lindsay. Go ahead. Hi, Don. Lindsay Chanel at USA Today. I wanted to ask you about Haley Jones from Stanford. I think she's a positionless player. She can do a little bit of everything for them. And I wondered in all your years of both playing and coaching, does she remind you of anyone? A couple of people have said she's Cheryl Miller. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't see Cheryl Miller play a whole lot because I was probably out, you know, in the playgrounds of North Philly. Um, but the footage of her and what I've hear of her, that might be a fair uh, comparison. Um, I think Haley Jones is, uh, you know, wears many hats for Stanford um, that impact the game. You know, her ability to play one through four, her ability to score, her ability to make great basketball plays, um, her ability to be an unselfish player that, you know, sometimes give up, you know, a, a good shot for a better shot. Um, um, it, it's felt. And I'm sure she's very happy being able to, to come back from an ACL injury um, and, and play and contribute in this way and, and, uh, and, and add to Stanford's remarkable season. Our next question comes from Joseph. Go ahead. Good morning, Don. Joe Gorcho, WIS News 10 in Columbia. Uh, two quick things. What do you remember about that 2017 matchup against Stanford from the Final Four in Secondly, what has Tara meant to you over the course of your career as a coach? Um, what, what I remember is we were down by, you know, I think nine points at halftime. And we 
weren't playing our, our best basketball, but we were just trying to trying to get to the locker room um, so we can make some adjustments. And um, once we got to the locker room, um, I, I asked our team, I'm, I'm, I'm having a serious, I asked a serious question. It's like, you know, why can't you all execute what we want to execute? You know, and then one of our players raises their hand, and I think it was Kayla Davis, and she was like, because um, we're millenniums? And I'm like, millennials? I'm like, really? That is the answer that you have? And we all kind of laughed, and, you know, we, we broke it down, huddled up, and came out and, you know, got into their lead, um, and then eventually ended up winning the game. Um, and then Tara. I mean, Tara has, been, has meant so much to me um, as a – you know, as a as a player, of course, because we've we've you know I've played for many teams that she's coached in USA basketball system. Um, but I also remember Tara. Um, I reached out to her 21 years ago when I told her Temple offered me the job, and I hope she remembers it. Um, so I asked her, "What what you know? What do you think, Tara?" She was like, "Don't do it." <laughs> I remember her saying that, like, vividly, don't do it. And I never asked her why, you know, um, or I don't remember the why. Um, but when she said that, it, you know, it was an immediate, like, I was, it was magnetic. I, I said, I got to take this job. Um, and for me, I need, I need some type of uh, chip, you know, and I, I think Tara saying that gave me a little chip on my shoulder to, to, to kind of prove her wrong. But I, I don't, I don't think she was saying it, you know, to, you know, she wasn't saying it because she didn't think I, I, I couldn't be successful. She was probably saying it because she knew that I was going to continue to play uh, professionally, and she was saying it because she knew the, the dedication and the work that goes into being a head coach because she, she had done it for so long. And I, I, I think she didn't want me to, to cheapen anything, cheapen my professional career or cheapen the game and taking that, you know, taking the, the head coaching job while, while playing. Um, but, I, you know, I thank her. 21 years later, um, making that decision has been – the most gratifying decision of, of all, and and I don't, you know, I don't look down on her because um, she put that chip on my shoulder. I just need, I just need that. I, I have a chip on my shoulder for the, the past 21 years, so I, I thank her for um, just making the chip a little bit bigger. Our next question comes from Doug Feinberg with AP. Go ahead, Doug. Hey, Don. Doug Feinberg, the AP. It's a really cool hat you got on. Uh, Gamecock looks neat. Um, I, I got two for you real quick. The first one is, does this Final Four feel similar? I know there's the COVID and everything else, but, like, does it feel like a Final Four since you've been here for two weeks already and you're playing the same arena and you've been in the same hotel, some a lot of it? Does it feel similar to the other years you've been in the Final Four? I mean, obviously it feels a lot different, you know. It feels a lot more um, confined, um, but yet it – you know, it feels like a Final Four. Like, I only see three other teams. Um, the signage around here, the signage at the hotel, um, I only see three other teams. And that that makes it special. That makes it, you know, I look on social media and I see teams that have gone home and they, they talked about, you know, being in the bubble for 16 days or 15 days or wh whatever it is. And I'm like, I'm thankful. I, I hope I'm confined for – you know, another four days um, because this is the, the pinnacle of our game. This is what we, you know, we practice, what we sacrifice, what we, you know, what we cry for, what we work for. And, you know, if it, if it doesn't feel like a Final Four, um, you're, you're in the wrong place. I mean, you have to put that energy into it. It's going to be what you, you know, what you feel it to be. It's going to be... And for, for us and our players, um, this is the perfect environment for them. You know, this is nothing more sweet than to be here and to be able to compete for a national championship. Again, since we're trying to get to as many questions as we can, we're going to limit to one at a time at this time. Michelle, your next question. Go ahead. 
Yeah, Coach Stale, it's Michelle Vogel from ESPN.com. You know, you've both played on and coached and coached against teams that have a lot of different options the way that Stanford does. You know, we had the other night, they have a player come off the bench and is their leading scorer. Is it, what's different about facing a team like that than, than say a team where you know it's basically going to be the, these five or six kids? Um, I mean, you, you, you can't look at it as, you know, the depth of Stanford. You can't look at it as, you know, they're going to spread you out and you, you can't look at the cumulative stats and you can't look at, you know, how many threes they make. You have to look at what you need to do to disrupt that. And that's how we're approaching it. We, we have to have major disruption um, and let the chips fall where they may. You know, we're, you know, you get two days to, to prep for a team like Stanford. You, you better concentrate on um, conceptually what they like to do. Because you can't, you know, they have so many options and so many um, um, options in, in, in all of their sets that if you try to uh, methodically go over all of them, you, you know, you, you, you're you not doing what you need to do to prep on the other side of the ball. So defensively, we got to, you know, I think we have an understanding of how we want to play um, them and their personnel and some some concepts that they, that they uh, frequently use. And then for us, we got to give it back to them. You know, we, we do some things that are deliberate and distinctive um, and, and on the offensive end, and you know, we, have to, we have to try to make sure that they're, they're making adjustments on, on, on the defensive side of the ball. Our next question will come from Mitch Brown. Go ahead. Hey, Coach. Mitch Brown, Watch Fox in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, you talked about um, – earlier this uh, bubble, making a home on the road. Um, tomorrow, Asia Wilson, she's releasing her candles. Obviously, you're in game mode, but she said uh, uh, that she's excited to be able to have all these milestones she's had be the sense of her candles. Um, I'm curious to you, um, what makes it uh, special to have them in San Antonio being close to you guys while you go through this experience, an experience you shared with her just back in 2017 as well? Well, I, I think any time you have a, you know, a former player, and Alicia Gray is here as well, um, any time you have players like that around that really understand, you know, what you're faced with and, and the mountain that um, you have to climb uh, to, to be a national champion, um, it's always great. You know, Asia's always on social media. I know our players um, follow her and – and they're tuned in to what she's saying. You know, some of the stuff is fun loving, you know, other stuff is she's dropping little nuggets um, for them to for them to um, for them to take and, and utilize um, because she's been in this position before. Um, but super proud of her just being able to spread her wings. I mean, she's not just a basketball player. Um, um, she's one that gives from the heart, you know, with her Asia Wilson Foundation. Um, dedicated to um, dyslexia, you know, now she's, you know, an entrepreneur and, and starting a candle um, business. And, you know, I, I think for her, um, you know, she likes the, the publicity, in the, you know, um, in her game. And, and, you know, but certainly if she would have given me a candle, I could have been on social media pushing it so it could be sold out by the time she rolls it out. But she's not thinking that way. So Asia, get with get with the program. I asked for a candle. A candle should have been here. I should have been enjoying it in my room um, of confinement. Our next question comes from Mel Greenberg. Go ahead. Hi, Mel Greenberg, one who's uh, guru. Thorn, that chip you just talked about was a little while ago with Tara. Uh, you take you down memory lane to the next step. He went out there with Temple a couple of years later. You know, an unknown team went up. I don't know if you remember the night or not. You went up 17. You were in that game until maybe the last two minutes out there. And uh, just remember, you know, when I was your first meeting with Tyree after you became a coach, what you remember about that night? Um, I mean, I remember losing. And then I remember Tara asking me to come speak to her team. <laughs> after you know after they beat us um but that's that's the kind of relationship we have you know it's 
You know, it, it is a game, but it's also a game in which you forge relationships with people that, you know, you've been in a foxhole with. Um, I, I would, you know, I would give Tara my last um, for just instilling in me um, some of the things that I utilize today. You know, her, her film sessions are, um, you know, a platform of learning and growing um, as a player. And now, you know, those habits that, that um, she allowed us to, to, to make when she was coaching us are, you know, some of the ones that I pass on to our players. So um, anytime that anyone that, that meets Tara is going to walk away um, with something um, that she said that, that's so profound, but yet so, so simple. I mean, Tara is really, you know, she keeps it as simple as possible. Everything that, that she says is relatable to um, a two-year-old, you know, or, or an 80-year-old. And that, her reach is very powerful. Our next question will come from Vicki. Please unmute your microphone and ask your question. Hi, Don. This is Vicki Fulkerson from the New London Day in Connecticut. I was wondering, um, with the with with your team obviously still playing and the U.S. team in town this week, um, how how you're juggling that? And do you just wake up every morning with a million things on your mind? Like how <laughs> I was wondering how you juggle all those thoughts at the same time. Well. Um... USA basketball is here um, and we're, we're, we're in training camp. Um, I am not a part of that training camp because we are, you know, we're bubbled up um, and we, we can't really leave our, our hotel. So, you know, there, you know, it's in the good hands of uh, Cheryl Reeve and Dan Hughes and um, Jennifer Rosati. Um, they're, they're doing a, a great job of holding down the fort. Um, something they had to do throughout this this past few years with me being on the, you know being the national team coach and um, they they're forging ahead you know they're forging ahead so and I you know I I really enjoy um, basketball a lot of what I do is 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 basketball related and you know I take the good the bad the ugly of the game because I I love it you know so the more that's piled on my plate. Um, the better for me. Our next question comes from Dick Cox. Go ahead. Hi, Dawn. This is Dick Cox, Lindy Sports and Cox Sports Broadcasting. Had the chance to talk with Asia Wilson yesterday and ask her any comparisons between her championship team and this team. She said totally opposite. She said this team was too nice. She said her team would have been cussing and hitting each other and all. And I think you did have a problem earlier in the year with this team being too nice. But over the last month and a half, they seem to have adapted uh, that physical play and have really been physical in their games and all. And do you think that got you to where you are now? Um, you know, our, our players are super nice. They're just really nice individuals. They have, um, you know, great, great parenting. Um, really respectful, um, almost to a fault. Um, but then, you know, they're super competitive, much more competitive than the 2017 team. And you tell Asia I said that, I know she's going to say something smart. Um, but they're much more competitive from day to day. Like day to day, they get after it. Um, and then once they leave the premises, they, they become really nice. But losing is not in their DNA. Um, and they don't like that feeling of losing. So the more games we lost, the better we got. Um, the more games we lost and the way we lost, um, we had to make a change. And we had to, you know, you have to be able to pivot and, you know, tell your players exactly what's happening out there and, and what's preventing us from, from winning and what will prevent us from winning a national championship. And that's, you know, that's when the light comes on. You know, ding, ding, ding. They're here to win a national championship. That's what they're they're driven to do, and you know, if anything that's going to separate us from doing that, you know, they hone in on even if it's even if it's uh, just playing more gritty, playing more physical, playing more um, together, doing what it needs needs to be done to to accomplish the the goal. Our next question will come from Howard. Go ahead. Don, good morning. I'm wondering, this specific matchup um, seems to me like a potential 
um, differential when it comes to pace. Uh, you know, you guys have played uh, significantly faster than Stanford this year, not, uh, you know, top 50 or anything, but I think 93rd overall. Uh, Stanford seems to be at its best when it's grinding people down and playing slower, but you've also been playing at a slower pace so far in this tournament. I'm wondering how you view the matchup, you know, within that framework and what you think is the best way for you guys to come out ahead of it. Um, I, I, I do believe we have to play fast. I mean, we have to generate more possessions um, in this particular game because Stanford is um, very patient offensively. Um, they will they will they will wait until you break down. Um, they'll they'll give up a, a good shot, um, probably a, a few times in a possession to get the best shot. And we have to stay engaged um, and locked in and not give up you know, open threes or uncontested layups. I think we need to play the game um, defensively with, with the ball in front of us. We got to always have, because our speed can play a part if the ball is in front of us. And then offensively, we do have to push. We have to push. Um, we got to try to get some early scores um, because we know they'll probably sag off on some people, you know, on our team. Um, and then we got to set great screens. Um, but we, we certainly have to have some pace to what we're doing. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can, we, can, we can shoot the ball well enough outside the three just to hold serve. Because if they're able to, you know, if they're able to shoot their, their average in threes and be as fish, efficient as they are with twos, it's going to be a long night for us. So we, we have to muck that up and find some ways to score um, in the paint and outside the three. Our final question this morning for Don will come from Doug. Go ahead. Hey, Don, Doug Farmer again. Let's have some fun here. It's April Fool's Day. I know you're a uh, big time prankster, I believe. What, what's your favorite or least favorite April Fool's Day joke that you've been hit with or done on somebody? Um, I mean, Asia Wilson got me yesterday. It wasn't an April Fool's, you know, but she was um, doing this TikTok thing where um, she FaceTimed me and then she said, um, I'm busy right now. And I'm like, what? And then she hangs up. And then she has me thinking like, did I call you? But she, called, but she FaceTimed me and I'm like, what? And then she did it to her mom. I saw her, she actually sent me the video where she did it to her mom. And um, and um, I, I don't think it went as 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 well as my the call she made with me. So she's got to watch out for who she's calling because um, she she could have pranked me pretty good, and I wouldn't have been my politically correct self. <laughs> so that's it. That's it for the April Fools. Don, thank you for your time today. Um, we'll let you go to get ready for your, your matchup with Stanford.